Right, okay, so good afternoon everyone uh, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Eddie Wood from Cardale Limited who will be delivering this session, uh, but before I hand over to him I just wanted to mention a few things. Uh, so firstly, for those of you who haven't attended one of our Irish webinars, I'm Ben Pollard and I take care of the technical aspects of these sessions. Any problems and I should try to assist as best as I can. Uh, on your screen then, most likely located at the top left hand side, you will notice a small bar with some written options on them, uh, which are chat and Q&A. If you have any technical issues or audio problems and need to message me at any point, please use the chat option. If you have any specific questions for Eddie, please use the Q&A option and ask your questions here. Uh, you can open and minimize these boxes at your own leisure and should a message be sent out to you, it will most likely flash orange. Um, so with that said, uh, Eddie, take it away. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys all the session. Thank you very much. Hi, Ben. Thank you for that. Thanks, everyone, for attending today. We really appreciate it. Just a wee quick bit about Cardale, first of all. So like our whole mission um, is about getting people to start really buying into this thing called personal responsibility. And to do that, we want them to be able to jump inside themselves and start questioning um, a lot of things about themselves. So really what I want to share with you today is just some highlights of our work. I mean, the subjects do get pretty deep at points. So, and I won't have time in 45 minutes to go through that all. And that's the way we'll be running this. I'll run this for about 45 minutes and allow for 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if there's no questions at the end, I have allowed for another 15 minutes worth of a presentation there. So what I would suggest to you is uh, just sit back and relax and, and see what you think about this stuff. So one of the first uh, places that we're trying to take our clients, and again, We've got a uh, new material we're presenting just now where we're seriously uh, questioning the word safety culture and we're re-looking at a thing called uh, building safe communities. We're also deeply uh, looking at uh, this word team and, and what that really means to people and we've got some fresh ideas in that as well. But before we could even get into that, it's very important that you understand the base stuff of what we're about and that's what I'm going to present to you today. So one of things we do, we do know about safety uh, from our experiences, it's made up of uh, two things. We definitely know that it is about systems and, and these are crucial, but there's this other side of the, the equation uh, and that's people and their motivations and choices and stuff like that they make. So first of all, let's look at uh, states of mind. So we look at this thing initially called conscious mind. So let me give you some uh, background in that and, and see if you can understand where it fits uh, and how sometimes people make errors. We actually uh, started researching uh, this cognitive psychologist. His name was uh, George Miller, and he wrote this wonderful paper uh, in the 1950s, which was called uh, The Magic Number, 7 Plus or Minus 2, uh, Some Limits to Your Consciousness. And initially, where he picked this idea up was he um, from he picked this up from philosophy way back in the 1870s. Now I don't know if any of you have ever heard this. Uh, it's a Victorian parlour game. It's called the Kim's Game. And during that period, there was this guy. Um, his name was William Hamilton. And um, what he used to do was he used to get into bars, taverns in Glasgow, and he used to place a tray down. He'd scatter so many items on it, and he would ask people to memorize what was on the tray. We would then cover it up, remove one or two things, and then uncover it. And if they could guess what he took away, people, what he took away then um, he would buy people a, a small whiskey. And if they got it wrong, they'd need to get him one. And, and he began to notice very quickly, once there was a certain amount of items on the tray, this guy just couldn't stop losing. So he wrote this in his philosophy papers, and this Harvard uh, psychologist, George Miller, um, picked up his paper and decided to take that into the lab. And he started doing all sorts of the tests. And really what he summarized at the end of that is that consciousness has a limited capacity and the conscious mind can only process so many chunks of information at any one time. And with seven plus or minus two, he discovered that some people can only process up to five chunks of information, some people seven, some people nine, and he found that geniuses could go up to about 11 
chunks at any one time. Now, the other interesting part we found in this paper was he also looked at this part of the mind of being a serial processor. And the way they sort of explain it is if you could imagine your conscious mind as a bit like a spotlight in a darkened stage. And if you look at a spotlight shining in a stage, you know, it can only hold so many things within its beam of light. And as a spotlight moves across a stage, as new things come in, other things actually drop out. So really what I'm trying to say is if all you guys listening in today could process up to nine chunks of information consciously and you have them sitting in conscious mind, then what I'm trying to say is any time you have a new thought or a new idea, you've got to drop something out to make way for that new information coming in. And look, I don't know if any remember a game show it was on TV, the Bruce Forsyth Generation game. This whole game was based around this, and that's the way I sort of look at consciousness. I look at it it's like a bit like a conveyor belt with so many items on it, and as one item comes on, one item needs to drop. Now, people ask all the time, what will consciousness hold on to and what will it let go? And the only answer for that is consciousness will only hold on to what you feel is immediately important to you at that time and anything else can just be totally uh, discarded for that. Okay. Next to the consciousness was in the 1980s, another guy came along called uh, Dr. John Ray. And this is, I don't know if you recall during that time, this is when uh, we were talking about attention span all the time. And he found that the conscious mind could only hold information for a maximum of 30 seconds and then it gets bored and it jumps on to something new. And a recent paper I was looking at, I'm actually terrified to read it because it's now stating that it's only 10 seconds and that makes us only five seconds sort of a better than a, than a goldfish, <laughs> you know, it's pretty scary. Um, so really what I'm trying to do with my work here is... Uh, sell this out to the workforce, give them real practical examples of this, you know, <clears throat> and then looking for solutions for that. So really what I'm trying to say to people is, you know, we all need to be aware that people do this. And this is why it is important that we do, do develop this sort of a safety community where people actually are giving each other safety reminders and helping throw things on each other's a conveyor belt. Other thing about it as well, what I really promote is this thing called immediate corrective action. You know, so what I'm trying to say is anytime you spot anything, anything that could harm you or another human being while it's on that conveyor belt, it's important for you to take immediate corrective action and sort it out as much as possible. So look, I've got a lot to get through here. I'd love to talk more about that, but really what I'm trying to say to you is not every human being can be fully conscious of everything that's happening round about them at any one time. So what we do is we all chunk information and data down, and what's ever on the conveyor belt, that is all that is all that we can really be in control of at that time. Okay. Next thing I take them into is this thing called uh, the subconscious mind. And what you, about this part of the mind, because what you have to know is sometimes uh, the, the brain doesn't like using consciousness all the time because this takes up a lot, a lot of energy. And part of being human is we're designed to actually conserve energy in case the body does come under any form of attack. So what you'll find from time to time as you go through your day, you begin to notice sometimes the conscious mind switches off. And then these sort of subconscious things start. Well, let me give you an example. You might know these, again, as below conscious behaviors. Like, for instance, how many times when you get up for work in the morning, as soon as you sort of uh, jump in the car, turn your key, your head goes somewhere else, but the car can automatically make its way to work. And you can sometimes pass through towns or villages, and you know in these towns and villages, there's maybe five speed cameras, roundabouts, you know, traffic lights, but yet you manoeuvred all that, and when you get through the other side of the village, you have difficulty recalling if you've actually went through it. You know, and I've got one as well, I call the, the meeting trance, 
how many times when you get into a meeting before, somebody up the front's giving it big licks, but you're sitting there consciously thinking, eyes open, pay attention, this guy looks like a question asker. And then all of a sudden, with your eyes open and ears open, your brain starts see, hearing different sounds and painting different pictures. And it's as if you start um, uh, going through an experience called mind and body in two different places, meaning your body's at the meeting, but your mind's running down the beach with Bo Derrick or, or George Clooney. Five seconds later, you pop back into the room and the speaker's on a brand new subject, but you sit there smiling, hoping they don't ask you a question because you're totally lost. Now, there has been some researchers that have looked into this and they've started looking at sort of a time limits when people do this. And what they tend to think is this is a naturally occurring rhythmic cycle that people actually go through. And they say it actually benefits for mental health. So what they'd really call this, if you want to look at this on the uh, internet, if you've not heard about this before, I would go and research a thing called the alpha state, okay, or driving uh, trances. And we've been aware of this for a very long time now. Again, psychologists don't really like talking about this especially when it comes to safety because nobody has the magic bullet or answers for this but there is really something that you can sort of do about this so let's look at uh, what psychologists how they look at it and how they link it to a skill and when you look at the four stages to obtain in a skill you're going to find the last stage is actually this state now let me take you back to when I was a kid and, um, and I was desperate for my parents to get me a bike. And I used to watch these kids go past on bikes outside. And at the time, I thought I could just jump on the bike and do it. So really, I didn't know that I couldn't do it. Now, psychologists have a name for this. They call this unconsciously incompetent meaning I didn't know I couldn't do it. Then my mum and dad, they got me a bike. And I remember when I jumped on that bike, I nearly broke my neck. And that was the moment I actually woke up and realised that it was a lot harder the more it looked. And psychologists call this conscious incompetence. So I'm now aware that I can't do it. But then what I noticed was I could only ride that bike consciously uh, or competently while I consciously thought about every single step. And then it was as if one day I just woke up and whispered to the bike, take me to the shops. And it just happened. And this is what psychologists call unconscious competence. And this is what we call in the UK uh, a skill. So whether you're learning to uh, ride a bike, you know, uh, learn a new trade or drive a car, you find eventually that this will become automatized and you will have these below conscious behaviors that take care of you while the mind just drifts. And this is this whole mind and body in two different places uh, sort of a scenario. So one of the things I'm really trying to push with this, again, is getting people to realize that they do this. And again, it's about them realizing that there has to be a deeper degree or some point of personal responsibility. I mean, a great way I, I've got explaining this, I remember I was on a building site in Glasgow um, when I was first researching this stuff and I approached this bricklayer and I asked him uh, how it is he actually lay bricks. And he, he looked at me strangely and then he says, well, there's two ways you lay bricks. And I thought the guy was going to be scientific. And eventually he says to me, there's the, well, there's the way the bosses think you lay bricks and then there's the way you lay bricks. Now, listen to the way the bosses think you lay bricks, his explanation of that, and this is more about conscious competence rather than unconsciously competent. He says, the bosses here, when, uh, when you're laying bricks, they think when I pick up a brick, as soon as I pick up the brick and cement, I pause, and I've got to think, what if that gets in my skin, gets in my face, um, gets in my eye, you know, or what's above me, below me, behind me? And then he has to think, can I injure anybody else here? And then he says, once I've got a green light for those three, I tuck in the brick. He says, and they think that I do this with every single brick. And if you had to do that, he said, we'd be paying three times the price for a house and what we are. And then I says to him, how is it you actually lay bricks? And he says, I lay thousands upon thousands of bricks every month. 
but I usually do this when my head is in the bookies. So again, this is just a demonstration to you about how human beings can automatize behavior while their mind drifts and does this mind and body in two different places. So the main thing about being a human being is what you need to get into your head is environment is everything, you know, and depending on what your environment and when you do this can depend sometimes what's really going to happen to you. You know, like for instance, I've got one I call the TV trance. You know, sometimes I can be sitting watching TV and my daughter will skip by me and I've been watching it for two hours and she'll say, Dad, what's on TV? And I've got to turn to her and say, I haven't got a clue. Now, I don't want to freak you out here. There is a part of your brain that does look out for you when you're in this mode. And they call this the amygdala. And this is like your early warning system or what psychologists call your fear alarm. And if you can imagine when you're in this state, this part of this amygdala is continually scanning your environment for any changes in your five senses. And any time there's a change, it's the amygdala's job to give consciousness, uh, consciousness a nudge, wake you up so you can check if it's a threat. And if it's a threat, you'll get into full stress mode and deal with that. And if it's not a threat, you'll probably drop uh, back into this state again. I know, and some of you may be aware of this, I know, like um, if you're driving in the motorway, we know you're going to do this. So, this is why rumble packs are put up the side of the lane to trigger the amygdala. You know, TV companies also know we enter this state when we're watching TV. And that's why just before the commercials come on, they like to increase the volume. And what they're really saying to your conscious mind is, wakey, wakey, pay attention. It's time to sell you stuff. And they lift you out of that moment. So really what I'm trying to get the teams to do now is to account for this. And uh, part of what I'm trying to get them to do here is persuade them the benefits of taking what's called a 20-second scan. So really what I'm saying to them, look, if you're a skillful person, you know environment's everything, and you know you're going to do this. So what you have to do before commencing work, you have to waken yourself up, and you have to prepare the environment in case you drop into this sort of a, a mode, you know? And again, it's about once you see anything that could harm you when you're in skillful mode, then you have to take immediate corrective action while it's on that conveyor belt because, you know, at any time it can sort of a drop off of you. Okay. And what we're getting, and we get a great response from that, you know, and again, it's about taking people on this journey where they can look inside themselves and look to themselves for solutions rather than always trying to uh, turn to the corporation. Now, the other thing you can do with this as well is you can build in what's called below conscious behaviors. Now, there is this thing that you guys, I know most of you guys are into it, you call it behavioral safety. Personally speaking, I'm not on that journey. Most clients that I'm seeing now is behavioral safety has just turned into another tick box exercise. And some of the guys just feel it's a new stick for them to be sort of a hit with. Now, I would like to hear if I could give you a quick introduction to behavioral psychology and, and again, show you how we're trying to use it. Because part of our mission here is to get people really motivated for safety and begin to try and change perceptions in that. Okay, so if you really want to understand how you change people, the first thing you have to think about is when you're in these automatic modes, what else is it then that can protect you? And that thing is your habits. Now, I do hear this saying quite a lot, that, uh, that practice makes perfect. Now, and I'm trying to get that out of people's heads because what you have to understand is practice doesn't make perfect. Practice actually makes habit. And that's why sometimes some of us have bad habits and some of us actually have good habits. So when it comes to forming habits, it's all about repetition. Repeat, 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 repeat. And it's the other thing, repetition is such a big thing. And if you want to make people make change, then you have to help them find ways of understanding this role of uh, repetition. So what I'd like to do for this section is I'd like to link behavioral psychology for you and a bit about 
sort of a repetition together because repetition is the answer to most things. I mean, if you even look at your beliefs, your beliefs are actually set by the way you repeatedly talk to yourself, you know? And if you do look at repetition as well, you have to understand that there is a difference between education and sort of a training or sort of a coaching. You know, like say for instance, I'm walking about a site and I see lots of people, you know, they've got a bad automatic lift. So they're sort of in this alpha state, this daydream state, and their habit is helping them, you know, pushing them uh, to lift incorrectly. Now, what I decide to do is get a trainer in for today and, uh, and show them how to lift boxes. But what I'll find is after an hour after the training, everybody is still lifting the way they did before the training. And here's the point I'm trying to make to you. You know, a one hit in a classroom, that's not how the subconscious learns that runs these programs. The subconscious usually needs about 21 days of straight repetition before it actually accepts something. And if you want to find more about that, I'd go and read the, the, the work of uh, Dr. Maxwell Maltz. So really, if I really want to change the way I lift, I need to find a way to get repeat, repeat, repeat. So what you can do is we've got clients doing is we get team members to buddy up with each other. So if I wanted to change the way I lifted, I have to repeatedly put this new lift on that conveyor belt for about 21 days before the subconscious makes it automatic. So what I can do is I can say to a colleague, look, anytime you see me going to lift incorrectly, I don't need a 20 minute conversation about body mechanics. I don't need a five hour lecture about the human work, the workings of the human spine. All I need you to say to me is mind your back and that'll waken me up and then I'll put the correct methods on when it's in the conveyor belt. And after 21 days, that's about me taking it on board automatically. And you've probably seen this through your life, you know, uh, the repetition used uh, to use a seat belt, tie shoelaces, you know, uh, if you look at uh, playing a guitar, you know, you need repetition for that. You need to sit and go conscious, 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 and then eventually the subconscious accepts it. Juggling's the same. So repetition is so, so important if we're going to make changes. And these one hat in the classrooms, they're only education and they will not be long lasting. So we have to move towards this line of actually getting people to help each other. Okay. The other thing uh, with behavioral psychology too, it's very important that we understand not just the repetition of frequency, but it's very important. We really need to understand the value of this thing called mental pairing. And what I find is people have really, and a lot of sites have got a really bad negative mental pairs with health and safety. I want to quickly show you how to break that. Okay. Now, behavioral psychology all started, I don't know if you're aware of this, with a guy called Ivan Pavlov and he's salivating dogs. And as I'm talking about this, I just want you to keep thinking about mental pair repetition, mental pair repetition because behavioral psychology is easy it's not as complicated as people are making it out to be so what he was he was tasked to do is he wanted to figure out uh, uh, the digestive processes of dogs so how much would a dog salivate when its tongue touched different foods and the idea was to go in every day they'd feed these dogs the dog's tongue would touch the food they catch the salivation in a vial and then they would measure that and see how slippy it was. And there's some great videos about this on YouTube if you can't get a mental picture of what I'm talking about here. Okay, so every day he would go in, he'd feed the dog, the dog's tongue would touch the food and the dog would salivate. But then one day, after so many repetitions, think about mental pairing here, all the dog had to see was the white coats approaching and the dog started salivating before the food was even presented. Now, at first they thought this was all about anticipation. And they were a bit confused to why this was happening because salivation was, was a, is a reflex. 
So what they decided to do was build a box, put the dog inside so it couldn't see the food approaching, and they put on a ticking metronome for 15 seconds. So they'd go tick, 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 open the hatch, feed the dog. The tongue would touch the food, the dog would salivate. But then what they noticed was after so many tries, the ticking metronome alone began to make the dog salivate. And then this leads up to the story about Pavlov ringing a bell, feeding the dog, ringing a bell, feeding the dog, and then the ringing bell alone made the dog salivate. Eventually, the military got a hold of this, and you can check it out. They were doing all sorts of experiments with this. Um, you'll find them again on YouTube. But eventually, the Americans came along, and they went and got a psychologist uh, called B.F. Skinner. And what the Americans wanted at the time, they wanted, they, they, they wanted Skinner to actually train a pigeon to sit inside a missile and act as the guidance system. And if you go research uh, B.F. Skinner, pigeon research, you actually see again the whole exercise is all about mental pairs and repetition. So what I mean by that is Skinner built this box and the first thing he wanted to do was to see if he could get the pigeon to turn left on command. So he put on this light bulb and see if he could get... Now, you know pigeons just dart about randomly and every time the pigeon accidentally turned to the left, he'd light the light bulb and he would give it something to eat till eventually the pigeon began to make that pair and it knew every time it turned left, then it was going to get fed. And eventually he was getting the pigeons to do all sorts of things. You should go watch it and you can see the power of this sort of a mental parent exercise and if you look advertisers grabbed a hold of this you know and this is one of the main ways they tried to sell as uh, products now they use this model uh, they call it contiguity and frequency now contiguity they took from the greek word conjugum meaning if, if two or more things happen together and frequencies that 21 days of repetition. So what they began, they know like if they repeat something to you, two events, then they two become one. So look, watch commercials tonight. Look, you'll see, you'll see they wake me up for the commercial. So they wake me up out of this trance, this alpha state or your mind and body to get your attention on TV. And then they do this to you. Good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, product name. And they know you won't get that first hit. So they know they've got to keep pounding it into your brain. Good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, product name. And what they are really hoping for is one day when you walk into the supermarket, as soon as you see that product, you will then go find that good feeling within yourself. And then before you know it, you're slam dunking it into your trolley, you know, and then you're moving on. Once you buy it a few times, you move on to this thing called brand uh, loyalty. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, health and safety, you have to really now consider, if you want people to be really motivated, you have to really consider what mental pairs are put across so people get that buy-in factor. Now, a lot of sites I go on to, I meet a lot of hard-working people, hard-working people in there trying to do their best and see 99.9% .9 of the time, we have very safe, productive days, but 1% of the time, things might not go quite right. And what can happen in a lot of places is see the 1% that hasn't been right. We can spend 99% of the time talking about that, you know, and the 99% that's going wonderful, we can spend 1% of the time talking about that. So again, this can create this mental pair of repetition with safety going bad feeling, bad feeling, bad feeling, bad feeling, bad feeling, bad feeling, bad feeling safety. And again, this can get locked into people's minds. And just like when people see a product, they access the good feeling. Anytime people hear the word safety, they actually can begin to access that bad feeling. So really what I'm trying to say here is if we get stuck wholly in negative, it's going to cause us problems. Now, but look, you can get stuck wholly in positive too, because that can cause its own problems as well. 
and you can miss things. So what I'm really trying to say to you here, it is okay to be negative, but you also have to find time to actually address those sort of a positives and start helping people anchor this new emotion to health and safety so they can begin to start feeling as if they want to become involved in that. Okay. Other things is uh, we look at is this thing called uh, fear of loss, you know, and with fear of loss, um, one of the main things we've found with that is one of the biggest fear of losses in the workplace we come across is this thing called uh, time versus risk. And what we notice about uh, human beings, and I've noticed this about myself as well, and I've had to readdress the way I look at my world. But again, with time, any time I'm late for an appointment, I used to find, like if I was late going for a check-in uh, at the airport, then my risk-taking behavior actually could increase. And when I had more time, I actually sort of a decreased. You know, so this time and risk scenario, what I'm really trying to say to you is we're running out of time, there tends to be a lot more uh, risk-taking activity. A lot of projects I work on, this is when it nears the end of the project and the time watching's going on. This is how there can sometimes be issues with that. You know, and I see it absolutely everywhere. You know, I mean, I was driving through an area once, I seen this older guy painting under the Eves' bungalow um, and he was way outstretched and I'm thinking he's going to have to make a choice and, and the, the choice he made totally blew my mind. You know, he grabbed on the ladder, bounced the ladder two or three times and then just continued painting again and I guarantee you his thought process was see by the time I get down these ladders, reset up all this equipment, that's going to take ages, just bounce, you can do it, you know. Um, also being in uh, workplaces as well, working beside guys, and they'll openly talk about it. You know, sometimes a guy can be in a job, um, the van's about half a mile away, he looks down at his toolbox, he realises he needs a hammer, looks down at the toolbox, and there ain't no hammer there. And all of a sudden, as he looks back, this little backhoe shifting spanner shouts up to him, I'll be a hammer for two minutes. I don't mind. So what we have to think about is this time and risk does create a lot of shortcuts for people. And sometimes these repeated shortcuts can actually, if they become repetition, they can become the new way or the sort of a new habit. Um, other piece to look at as well, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, um, this thing called self-talk uh, inner dialogue. And the way we all talk to ourselves is very, very important. You know, it doesn't matter what reality we're all seeing, it's the self-talk that we have within ourselves that actually makes a decision what we individually can believe about that. Now, one of the, the, the big things about safety is a lot of people have this self-talk going on in their head that bad things only happen to other people. They're always careful. They've did this job for 25 years and they've never cut a finger. Now, this is actually a defense mechanism because if people were getting up every day and they actually thought that bad things were going to continually happen to them, then their anxiety levels would be through the roof. So sometimes it's a self-talk that can take us into situations that we would rather not be in, you know. And what I've noticed is, is although the self-talk negates uh, accidents for the self, it's, it's crazy how when we observe other people doing the same thing, we actually score that they might have an accident with that. You know, a great question for you is, is why is me standing on a chair changing a light bulb? appears to you uh, a bit different if it's you doing it. That's right, because you're always careful. You know your own experience space. Uh, or why is it me standing on a pipe doing a job seems different if it's you? So one of the things we have to really think about is this sort of a self-talk. You know, and because <clears throat> once you got hold of that, then you're starting to look at reshaping sort of a whole perceptions here, you know, and self-talk is so important by how, how we look at the world, because as human beings, we can talk ourselves into sort of a, any situation, you know, and if you look at this, not just in a physical world, but also in a psychological world, you know, I'm, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's two 
uh, different forms of depression. They say, you know, there's chemical depression and there's this thing called reactive depression. Reactive depression all comes from self-talk. So whatever the self-talk keeps repeatedly telling the brain, then that's the beliefs that start getting set up. You know, and this is why part of the work that we are doing is we are moving away from actually just observing people's behaviors and the choices they're making. And we now want to have conversations about beliefs to them. You know, now uh, we made this model up and um, and it's, people get it pretty quickly. Now, we took this model. I don't know if any of you have heard of a, a form of therapy called cognitive behavior therapy. And all cognitive behavior therapy is really is getting the patient to put new things repeatedly on their conveyor belt of consciousness for so many days. And then a reset happens in the subconscious. And there's also this other therapy called a rational emotive behavior therapy. And that's all about inner perceptions and beliefs. And this comes from psychotherapy, a guy called a Dr. Albert Ellis. You should read his work. It's absolutely fascinating. So here at Cardale, we've got this model we use uh, about the beliefs and, and how it works. There's four st stages. And watch how at the end, behavior is not actually a cause here, it's actually a symptom. So say I said this, whatever people believe, um, that affects what they expect. And what you expect begins to affect how you feel, and how you feel will affect how you actually behave in this world. So let me say, I said, you see I got up every day, and I believe that my glass is half empty. And guess what? I start expecting bad things to happen all day. And this then accesses negative emotions. So my behavior is going to be every time you walk past me at work and say good morning, I'm going to be Mr. Grumpy. You know, but yet there's some people got up and they're coming into the same experience every day and they believe their glass is half full and they expect wonderful things to happen to them because they've got this expectation, they access the good feeling and then these good feelings actually come out in their behaviors. And what we're trying to do with this is by directing beliefs, you know, we've got this other model we call the, the beep to beep cycle and part of our leadership training is getting leaders to have the correct behavior. So this feeds into the team's beliefs. So we're trying to move away from observing teams all the time and beginning to try and shape these communities where people have the right self-talk, the right beliefs within themselves, but also they know about the internal mechanics of themselves. So look, I've gave you quite a lot there. Just quick, I'll just quickly run through that one more time because um, this is the basis of, of our work. You know, there's another uh, two step ons for this. Okay, so what I'd really like you to think about here when you go back to your people, look, let them know that they have this thing called the conscious mind. It's got a limited capacity. We can only process so many chunks of information at any one time, you know. Things slide out in and out of consciousness all the time. So this is why it's important, you know, that it's, we do take this thing called immediate corrective action. The other thing about this conveyor belt, when people are highly stressed out, you know, sometimes the conveyor belt can get jammed. And when the conveyor belt gets jammed with stress, even things directly in front of us can appear invisible. Let me give you an example of this. How many times you've been stressed out, you need to leave the house in a hurry and you're looking for a set of keys and you can't find them. And you've been backwards and forwards to that table at least a dozen times and you swear the keys weren't there. Then you go back one time and they're sitting right in the center and you think, who the hell put them back there? The key fairy, you know? So again, Consciousness is not perfect and you have to assist people so when they go to work every day, they can account for this and help themselves, but at the same time, give them the energy to create this thing called a safety reminder community where everybody is looking after their neighbor. The other thing as well is consciousness switches off. 
it switches off. If you're doing something that's familiar to you, something you've repeated lots, you will then begin to build in these automatized behaviors. It's very, very important that people understand environment is everything and we have to prepare the environment before they go into work. But the other thing is they have to get into the habit of wakening themselves up before they get into skillful mode. And then they can work away as they do. But also, again, this makes great sense for us to create this reminder community where people look after their neighbor. Think about repetition. Think about repetition, you know. And what are people repeating? And what we've got to try and do is find ways of just moving away from these one classroom hits to get and repeat, repeat, repeat going. And a great way to do that is once people understand this, you can get agreements from work parties and they can then begin to run campaigns of reminders to build in the right automatic behavior for the future. And again, think about the mental pain and this good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, safety, so we can get people right on board, motivated, and fully behind the cause here. Okay, think about time and risk and what that does to people. You know, you have to really think about this self-talk. And this is the thing that we should be trying to change. Once you can change a person's self-talk, then the potential for change and growth, not just for the business, but for people within your workplace communities will be able to thrive. So getting that self-talk to change is very, very important because we know that that's the very thing that feeds these beliefs that affect what we expect, that change how we feel and affect how we behave Okay. Other thing to think about, you know, my new work is all looking about creating, I'm uh, moving away from this thing, culture, I'm moving towards building safe communities. Uh, also as well, I think uh, in the current workplace, the, the, the word team team is just is just disappearing just down to how the world is working now with short-term contracts contract and so a lot of places i'm going to people are actually seeing themselves more as tribes rather than teams and i've just uh, did some real interesting work on that uh, also as well i'm reframing this thing called the zero that you guys are into. And, and the reframe I'm going for, the new cell with this, is all about personal responsibility. And it's about getting the teams to realize that the zero doesn't belong to the business. The zero actually belongs to them and the neighbor that's standing beside them. And those kids that wave them off every day to work saying, see tonight, mom, see tonight, dad. It's their zero, it's their family zero, and it's getting them to unite together as a community and a tribe so we all take care of each other. Okay, That's just um, a wee bit about what interests us and the work we do. We're not safety professionals in any way. I mean, all our guys are all into some form of uh, uh, therapies or, uh, or you know psychology in some degree but the messages that we're trying to sell is uncomplicated messages and taking all the mystery um, out of these pretty deep subjects so um, I hope that helped you and I'm now willing to sit back see if there's any questions Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much, Eddie. That was really informative. Um, so we have had a couple of questions come through uh, at the moment. So the first one that I'm going to ask um, is, uh, how can we turn a visual message into a meaningful safety message in the workplace environment? Um, is it right to reinforce some media materials by talking about them during safety interventions? So, for example, you know, safety talks, consultation sessions, uh, training meetings, those kind of things. So, uh, could you repeat that question? We're trying to the visual yeah. message. Yeah, sure. So, uh, how can we turn a visual message into a meaningful safety message in the workplace environment? Right. I mean, what I mean, the main message that I, I would be trying to get across is that leaders are there to actually support people. You know, uh, I'm not into really your visual messages and 
and poster campaigns and stuff like that. For me, uh, most of my clients, they have to go through a strong period of um, leadership visibility because the thing with human beings, as I don't know if you've heard the saying before, I'll believe it when I see it. So it is really important, you know, that the leaders, the leaders um, actually show up and, and they're the strongest visual message. Other thing I have to think about with this as well is uh, there's a thing human beings do, it's called calibration, you know, and they calibrate to others in their environment. And for us, the supervisor is the person the worker comes into contact with on the most frequent basis. So looking for change, the visible message that I've got is it happens more walking the beat than it does, you know, we. Uh, poster campaigns, safety meetings, and stuff like that. Hope okay. that helped. Yeah, I would imagine so. Um, that's great. I mean, they, they have just sort of come back and said, I see, so supervisors and leaders do play an important role. So, yeah, so yeah definitely. Uh, okay, we've got, so we've got another one here. Um, what do you find the best way to influence mental pairing with regards to health and safety? I mean, it's about trying to rebrand it. So what, what the first thing we do, now you have to be very careful how you, you praise in the UK. I mean, I was over in America working and they praise completely different, you know. And people in the UK, when you praise them, there is techniques. I can't get into them here, it would be too long. But you have to be sneaky when you praise in the UK. Okay, so what I would be suggesting, if you want to begin making changes, you know, because a lot of people, they think when they're going on a safety tour, they're going out to catch people doing things wrong and make wrong tick lists and then feed back all the mistakes to them, you know. But the other thing you have to be thinking about here is getting out there and catching people doing things right. And it is crucial that you guys really understand the difference between reward and recognition. You know, they're two different things. And what you have to do is rather than give out sometimes these simple rewards, sometimes given the right level of recognition can begin to set the right mental pairs up because it's these mental pairs, okay, it's these mental pairs that again begin to change the self-talk and once the self-talk begins to change then you're opening up to new beliefs which in turn will return your new behaviors okay great um we don't seem to have had any other questions coming in uh, i don't know whether people are still possibly writing some but if you do have any questions uh, you know please put them forward now uh, eddie i don't know whether there's any anything else you wanted to kind of uh, talk about at all i mean we've still got another uh, another sort of uh, 12 13 minutes left um mm -hmm. and obviously i can always interrupt as, as questions come in if that if that would be easier yeah um okay uh, in fact having said that one has literally just come through so uh, i'll we'll go on to this one if, if you're okay with that sure uh okay so this person has asked uh, do you believe that non-technical skills play a part in how people retain information uh, and should uh, and should psychometric testing uh, form part of the employment life cycle including during selection incident investigation and staff retention Ooh, right. What I would suggest about psychometric testing, the problem with that, you know, some people totally believe in it, right? But it's not quite my bag. So what I think about psychometric testing is it sort of measures you where you are at that very moment. You know, and life changes all the time. And as life change, people change. I mean, if you look at the German Wings pilot, I mean, he was heavily psychometrically tested. And again, it only gives clues. I wouldn't say it says this is sort of a definite. And when it comes to technical skills, I mean, technical skills are put in there by repetition, you know. So it is important, you know, because when you think about the subconscious mind, it doesn't know that what's right or wrong. If you repeat something bad, it locks into that. But if you repeat something good, it also locks into that. So sometimes when it comes to technical training, sometimes it's not the person. Sometimes it's what they've been repeatedly exposed to as they've been making their way forward. So this is why, like, I know safety people are right on top of this, and they're always examining the technicality of the sort of a, how people are trained. But 
psychometric test, and I think that would just sort of a take care of where you are emotionally now. But I mean, I could be psych psychometrically tested today, and I could have a tragic event happen to me tonight, and I could be a different man tomorrow. Okay, great. Uh, so we've had a, we have had another one come through as well, actually. So uh, this person has said that uh, we're doing a campaign at the moment of raising awareness of if in doubt, ask. Um, do you have any suggestions to assist with getting the guys to ask their mates when they are uh, when they're not sure of something? Right. Well, what you have to do is it depends all about how you're employing people. You know, I mean, you might have a, a visitor visiting there for a day or somebody coming in to do like a job for an hour or so. So when it comes to human beings, the main thing you have to think about is, is environments, everything. Now, I go into some places, you know, and the environment is so strict and like people are afraid to do anything and, and to bring anything up in case they're judged on that. So again, trying to create this whole community spirit, you know, and what I would suggest, if you want that to happen, then it has to be led off. And this is what the leaders are, are, are there for. And if I was running a campaign like that, I would be out there with the leaders and I would actually be positively selling it. And again, it would need to be sold through actions and then would need to go through the supervisors before the teams would actually buy into that. But we would need to visibly demonstrate that we were reshaping the environment and it was okay for that. You know, and again, people need to understand things like tone of voice. You know, some people go on site and they think it's all about words. You know, but tone of voice accesses emotions and as is body language, you know, that helps us judge what's coming next. And sometimes, although we're running these campaigns, approaching people with the wrong tone, wrong body language can take us down that bad route. So what I would suggest if I was running that campaign, if I was the safety person, I would be going out with the leaders and the main thing I would be looking at it's not just the words they were using, but how they were approaching, how the voice tone was, and how they reacted to each of the questions. And then in the walk back, I would be then giving them some coaching and then go over and then rehearse that with another group. And I would keep, have to keep repeating that. This can take some time before you get that big sort of a circle of trust going on. But the leaders need to be doing it initially. Right. Okay. We've uh, we've had a couple more questions come through actually now. So people are starting to starting to use their fingers and get typing in. <laughs> um, uh, so the next question that's come through uh, is uh, the HSE use fee for intervention to make money, and that relies on finding something wrong. Uh, is this negativity entirely counterproductive to improving health and safety performance? Uh, um, look, I wouldn't say uh, if you're stuck on negativity, right, then your people will get stuck there. I'm actually saying it is okay to be negative, but you always have to have the other side to that. And you've got to make a point, you know, if, if you want a strong group of people who are coming in, punching the sky for you, then repeatedly feeding back errors and mistakes to people is going to knock them over. You know, so yeah, you could, uh, I use HSE stuff all the time. It's, it's very valuable. But what I feel is a lot of places I've got, go to, they'll get stuck in this mode that this is the only way. I mean, do you imagine you're coming into work every day and somebody's tapping you going, that's wrong, that's wrong, that. Eventually, you're just going to give up on that. So it's about finding a balance between positive and negative. You know, there's this pendulum they use in mental health. And what they say in mental health is if you're negative all the time, okay, you talk to yourself negatively and all you see is negative in the world, that will eventually wear you down and you'll eventually fall into some mental health issue. But they also say if you're positive all the time, that can create mental health issues because life's not like that and a lifetime of disappointment can let you down. So what you should be trying to do is find this balance in the middle where the negatives are actually looked at or sold as improvement opportunities and not a stick to be hit with, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to promote and encourage immediate corrective actions by site operatives? 
Right, again, I would be, it's about getting out there, selling to them the, the human side of them, how this is all built in. Now, what we're about as well, I know you guys are into culture, but we are into building safe communities, and everything we do is all about realizing how we all work and realizing what we're coming into work for. Now, most people, most companies I go into, uh, the people at the top of the companies think the teams are buying into the corporate values. But a lot of sites I go on, that's not occurring anymore, you know, because the workplace changed. And people are more tribal now. So people are coming into the workplace and I ask them, what are you here for? And the, the top answer is money. Second answer is have a safe, productive day. And the third answer is to get back to my family and have a great evening. So what I try to do with the people I'm working with is rather work off these corporate values. I work off the values that they have and then I build all my immediate corrective action stuff around their requirements, not the corporations. And it, it seems to get there a lot quicker. Right, okay. Uh, someone's actually asked if you could just repeat the name of the uh, gentleman you mentioned in Glasgow carrying out uh, parlor memory tricks. William? Uh, his name was William Hamilton. William uh, Hamilton. 18, 18, 1840s, I think he was. And if he checks as well, there was another guy in England who was doing it too in the Liverpool area, and his name was Jevons. Jevons. Right, okay. Uh, they've also asked um, if you could repeat the term and they put in brackets with a question mark um, contiguous frequency? Uh, it's actually contiguity, contiguity and frequency. And they took this from the Greek word uh, conjugum, meaning if two or more things happen together. So this is the mental pairing and the frequency is just repetition. So mental pairs, repetition. Once they, they go together for about 21 days, they're locked in. Excellent. Okay, well, that clears that one up. Uh, that appears to be all of the questions at the moment. I don't know whether there are any more coming through, but we've answered everything that has come through so far um, with really, uh, you know, a minute or two to spare. So I don't know whether you've got any sort of passing words of wisdom before we... Before we yeah, the I mean, uh, one of my new pieces of work is I'm heavily into people accessing fantastic emotions within themselves. And we do have this thing called a uh, psychological priming and the way we talk to ourselves can really set us up for the day so if you're repeatedly waking up every day and you're thinking i'm going to have a crap day then you're setting yourself up for that so one of the great things you should be trying to think about if you're sincere about getting people back to their families every day you should be waking it up and priming yourself for that uh, that day so what we should be waking it up is thinking about how we're talking to ourselves as soon as we open our eyes and how we repeatedly these ongoing conversations are the things that can actually change you and here's the thing about change when i first started doing this job i thought i could change everyone and then i realized that change was actually a personal thing and what i noticed in life was every time i changed those round about me changed so what I would be suggesting to anybody listening, if you are really keen to help others to change their life, to get home safely, then running about screaming at them, change, change, won't occur. The change happens within you. It's a personal thing. And the way to get around that is your self-talk. And these are the three, two most important words we self-talk are the words, I am. And whatever really follows that, you know, if you repeatedly say, will eventually become part of you. So if you're waking it up every day and saying, I am happy, I am ha believe me, that repetition will access those emotions. But if you keep waking it up every day and thinking, I am useless, uh, I am tired, I can't be, these things will eventually get hold of you. So what I would suggest to everybody listening is you have to be the change you have to decide i'm going to be the difference i'm going to be positive but i'm going to make sure that i'm helping others to take great care excellent 
I think that's a, I think that's a really valuable thing to take away from all of this. Um, I'm going to close the session in a second, though. Just two very, very quick questions I wanted to just uh, run past that have just come through. Firstly, sure. was uh, you are talking about the 21 days of repetition. Can you yeah. remind us of, of the name of the person, Dr. Max? It was Dr. Maxwell Maltz. Now, and, and the subject's a cracking subject to read about. And when you read it, it really makes you reflect. And the subject is called psycho-cybernetics. And like cybernetics is a Greek word meaning helmsman who steers you to a port. So what the word psycho-cybernetics means is become your own helmsman of your own mind. Right, okay. It's a great subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just very briefly, very finally, um, can you clarify the term amygdala? Uh, amygdala. Oh, a sorry. Amygdala. amygdala. Okay, and what you'll find is this is the sort of a fear response you have within yourself. And what people will recognize it with is a, what they call reaction time. You know, because sometimes you can be in these automatic states and then a change comes and by the time you react, the time the amygdala kicks in, you know, sometimes you can follow through. And that's what I would be suggesting. Any's out there, get staff driving about in vehicles, make them aware of the amygdala and I guarantee you they'll give themselves that two extra seconds of space. Great, that's fantastic. Okay, uh, we are going to call it a day there. Um, for those of you who have been sat in on the session, just to let you know that we have recorded this, so it, it is going to be something that we'll, uh, we'll post um, on the IOS YouTube channel and stick on the group's microsite so that you can play it back uh, and share it amongst colleagues who you think might benefit from it. Um, also, likewise, if you've missed anything during the session at all or need to be reminded of anything that, uh, that Eddie had mentioned, um, you know, you can review all of this back. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So um, that's okay. So with that said, uh, a massive thank you to Eddie for taking the time out today to deliver this session. It's been very, very thought provoking, and I, and I think a lot of people will agree very valuable as well. Um, thank you to everyone who has attended this session. I will be in touch with you all via email in due course uh, to provide you with some more, more details um, following the session. Uh, and in the meantime, all that's left to say is uh, thank you and, and have a great afternoon and weekend, everybody. Uh, and thank you again, Eddie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity, Ben. We really appreciate it. That's not a problem at all. Uh, so I'm going to close the session now. So most of you will notice that your screen will all of a sudden go blank. So thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye.